In every field, be it art or science, there exists a seminal book. It is the book that everyone who is interested in this field is supposed to know and read at least once. The Origins of Species by Charles Darwin, Atomic Theory by Niels Bohr, The Prince by Machiavelli or The Art of War by Sun Tzu are all examples of such books. If we talk about card magic, then this book is called The Expert at the Card Table. Written in 1902, it influenced generations and generations of magicians. Di Vernon, one of the most important figures in the history of magic, was inspired by it and said that it was the greatest book on cards ever written. And here is the most fascinating fact about the experts at the card table. Even though it is considered to be the Bible by card magicians all over the world, we do not know who wrote it. Never like riddles. Learn to. My name is Alex Romanov, I'm a magician and an art historian. In this episode, I will tell you about one of the coolest mysteries in the history of magic. We will try to find out who stood behind the greatest book on cards ever written. This episode is produced in partnership with The Vanishing Inc. Let's start! The passion for play is probably as old and will be as enduring as the race of men. Some of us are too timid to risk a dollar, but the percentage of people in this feverish nation who would not enjoy winning one is very small. The passion culminates in the professional. He would rather play than eat. Now let me correct myself. We do know who wrote the book. There's a name on the cover. S. W. Erdnase. But the problem is that S. W. Erdnase is not a real name. There was never a person registered anywhere under the name of Erdnase. So the question is, who stood behind this pseudonym? But there is an even more important question. Why do we care at all? First, the deeper I got into the subject, the more I felt like Sherlock Holmes. Actually, this would be a perfect case for Holmes because it has everything that makes a thrilling detective story. Old diaries, cold hotel rooms, strange coincidences, gambling, secret identities and even murder. Second, as I already said many times, The Expert at the Card Table is THE book on card magic, so learning more about its author can bring us new insight on the art of magic in general. And last but not least, we have a book that influenced the whole art of magic, and its author just disappeared. Isn't it amazing? He never capitalized on the success of his masterpiece. No one knew for sure why he had written it or how he had learned his skills. It is a fantastic mystery, a great puzzle, and magicians love great puzzles. Was he a card cheat or a magician who created a secret identity, a criminal or a businessman who led a double life, or famous writer Mark Twain? During the last 80 years, Dozens of people became obsessed with the idea of finding out who Erdnays was. Erdnays hunt, as magicians like to call it, is a real phenomenon in the magic world, and it captivates the imagination even of those who are not interested in magic history. It is easy to prove it by making a simple online search. There is a thread on the forum of a popular magic magazine, Genii dedicated to the question of the real identity of Erdnase. This thread has continued for 17 years and has 191 pages with contributions from magicians and historians. There are several theories. I will tell you about two of them because I think they are, they are really cool and I hope that you will agree with me. But before I start, let us talk real quick about the book itself to have a better understanding of what it is about and why it matters so much. Here are five things that you need to know about the expert at the card table if you have never heard about it before. It teaches how to cheat at cards. For example, how to false shuffle or deal cards from the bottom or switch cards in order to get the best hand. 
It also teaches some magic tricks, but this is not its primary purpose. Unlike other books on card cheating, it was written not to criticize gamblers and expose their evil methods, but to teach them in every detail, including the psychology and the mindset that one needs to use these techniques in real life. This book has very nice illustrations and moves are described with incredible precision, starting from the position of every phalange of every finger and finishing with the angle at which the deck should be held. The book is very well written, it is smart, it is ironic, there are some Latin and French words and sophisticated stylistic devices. After the expert was published, no one cared. It was super expensive and no one had ever heard the name Erdnays before, so no one was interested in buying it. Things changed more than 10 years after it had been printed, because of Di Vernon. The expert at the card table became the main source of inspiration for Vernon. He understood that card cheats were much better at deception than magicians, and that if he could apply these techniques to magic, he would revolutionize the art. He learned the expert by heart came to New York, astonished everyone with his incredible skills, and started preaching this book. And magicians had no choice but to believe him. And finally, there is some irony in the fact that this book became so important for magic. It was not written for magicians. Its second title was Artifice, Ruse and Subterfuge at the Card Table. Erdnaz's main task was not to teach magicians methods that can be used to entertain their audiences, but to teach card players how to deceive for real, how to win and prosper. But it were magicians who took this book to their hearts. And like any good card sheet, Erdnaz knew when to leave the card table. When magicians started looking for him, he was nowhere to be found. No one ever gets to me. And no one ever will. Okay, now you know enough about the book, let's get to work. It will not make the innocent vicious or transform the pastime play into professional or make the fool wise or curtail the annual crop of suckers. But whatever the result may be, if it sells, it will accommodate the primary motif of the author, as he needs the money. The first journalistic attempt we know of to penetrate the pseudonym came in a column of a popular magic magazine for magicians, The Sphinx, in 1928, 16 years after the book had been published. The article said, One must not forget that excellent treatise by W. S. Erdnays, E. S. Andrews, the expert at the card table, being an exposition of artifice, rules and subterfuge at the gambling table. Wait a second, E. S. Andrews? What? Years later, the same author elaborated on that point. Who was S. W. Erdnays? Very little practical information concerning him is available. It has been said that his real name was E. S. Andrews, which in reverse order produces the pen name under which he wrote. So Erdnays is not just a pseudonym, it is an anagram. What's, a, what's an anagram? But the real search for Erdney started only in 1946, 44 years after the book had been published. Martin Gardner, a 32 years old magazine writer and an amateur magician from Chicago, started to get interested in Erdney's. Erdney's had probably been dead already. All he had was a theory that his real name was Andrews. And lots of rumors, even that Erdney's was still alive or some hard-to-believe stories, like that of a famous magician John Scarney, who used to claim that he had dined with Mr. Erdnays many times. But Gardner decided to avoid rumors and to start with the book. The title page of the original edition claimed over 100 drawings from life by M. D. Smith. This clue sent him searching for the illustrator, the M. D. Smith, and Gardner found him. In 1902, when the book was published, Smith was 25. When he met Gardner, he was in his 70s. Gardner met Smith and showed him a copy of the book. Smith recognized his sketches. He recalled that many years ago, in 1901, he had had an appointment with a man that he had never met before. They had met on a cold winter day in a cheap hotel room in Chicago. The man turned out to be a card cheat who had been working on a book about cards. He needed illustrations for this book. He showed Smith some card tricks to warm up, 
complained about the cold weather and then started to show cheating techniques step by step. Smith's task was to make sketches, which later became the part of the expert at the card table. However, Smith couldn't recall the name of the guy. When Gardner asked him if it could be Andrews, he agreed. Gardner invited Smith to the annual convention of the Society of American Magicians, where the illustrator signed copies of the book for several Erdnays fans. Now, just imagine, you are in your 70s and suddenly you discover that you are an illustrator of the book that you completely forgot about. And it turns out that this book is considered to be a bible by the whole magic community. This should be really weird. Later, Gardner got some new information. One of his magic colleagues told him that there was a magician named Ed Pratt, who had said he had known Erdnays. Gardner found Pratt. He was alive and lived in a retirement in Philadelphia. Gardner found his address and began a correspondence. Pratt was reluctant to discuss the matter. He only confirmed that Erdnays' real name was indeed Andrews, but did not want to tell more. And as we will see later, he could have had his reasons. He probably wanted to forget the story. But Pratt gave three clues. First, ES were not real initials. Second, Andrews had died in 1905. And third, his death had taken place in California. With the help of his friend in San Francisco, Gardner found out that in 1905, San Francisco newspapers printed stories about a man named Milton Franklin Andrews. He found these articles and got photos of this man. Pratt admitted that the man in the pictures was the man that he had known. Now, here is an important thing. Pratt never met anyone who presented himself as Erdnays. He only thought that he knew who Erdnays was. And here is why. It turned out that Ed Pratt had a friend, George Taylor. Taylor was a student of a card cheat named Andrews, who mentored him in the techniques of card cheating and then parted with him. This friend told Pratt that Andrews had been working on a book about cards. He never mentioned its name, but he revealed some techniques from this upcoming book. Later, Pratt got a copy of the expert at the card table and recognized the moves that his friend showed him. So he concluded that it was Andrews who had written the book, which meant that Andrews was Erdnays. Then another magician, Jay Marshall, an important personality in the magic world of the 20th century, found a sister of Andrews' wife. Alberti Walsh. She remembered Andrews and said that he had used to show her some cool card tricks. She also remembered that once he had shown her a book on cards and she had been very impressed with the illustrations. Finally, in 1950, Gardner mailed Smith his first contact, the illustrator of the book, copies of Andrews photos. At first, Smith was unsure that this was the man that he had met in the hotel room. But he concluded that the more I look at the front views, the more I'm sure they look like Andrews. So, Gardner concluded that he finally solved the case and identified the man, Milton Franklin Andrews, aka S.W. Erdnays. Who was he? And most importantly, why were his photos on the front page news of the San Francisco newspapers in 1905? It's time to reveal the truth. Our tuition was received in the cold school of experience. We started in with the trusting nature of a fledgling and the calm assurance born of overwhelming faith in our own potency. We bucked the tiger voluntarily and sanctioned no one for the inevitable result. Since the age of 18, Milton Franklin Andrews began his career as a gambler. By the turn of the 20th century, he had moved up to the big stake games throughout the cities of Central and Eastern states. He won quick and lost quick. Once he showed up at his brother's with $25,000 in cash. Just some made it, mama. It's a success. But when he returned a few months later, he was down to 6,000. With him, it was always easy come, easy go. He became one of the best card professionals in the country. In 1902, he self-published the book where he summarized his experience. 
This book was the expert at the card table. By the end of 1903, Milton Franklin Andrews reached the peak of his career. For the next two years, he claimed to have averaged $20,000 a year gambling. If we convert it to today's dollars, it would be around $590,000 a year. I am supposed to be about the best man in the business playing poker, he wrote later. He spent a lot, but spent wisely. His earnings went for the necessities of his work – fine women, clothes, jewelry and travel. All of which were not merely pleasures, but the means to advancement. Travel, for example, meant first-class trains and ships, but these costly vehicles were also prime venues for profitable games of poker. He met Bessie, a prostitute with a drinking problem who promised him to quit and join him in his travels. Together they moved from town to town, and their private life was always full of violent arguments. They never spent too much time in one town. After Andrews won some money, they left before anyone could start looking for them. Everywhere he was, Andrews bought vests, a lot of expensive vests and also a lot of expensive jewelry for him and Bessie. And malted milk, huge quantities of malted milk. The reason for that was that Andrews had stomach problems and had to commit to a special diet, and malted milk was part of this diet. This is why later the title of a newspaper article about him would say the case of the malted milk murderer. Wait, did I just say… murderer? I did, because Andrews killed Bessie in a very gruesome manner by shooting her and then burning her body. This is why he began to be chased by the police. He soon became one of the most wanted criminals in the US. The most remarkable crook of the decade. A career which has had few counterparts in the annals of crime. Newspaper headlines said. Andrews and his new partner in crime, Nulda, were on the run. In 1905, they checked into a hotel in San Francisco using fake names. During this time, Andrews wrote two letters to newspapers where he described his terms of surrender, which were just too ridiculous to be accepted. And he also added, I will never be taken alive, neither will Nulda. She has carbolic acid, and I have a gun. Andrews never left the hotel room. His girlfriend bought food and also tried to convince everybody that she stayed in this hotel room alone. But the locals got more and more suspicious, and finally they called the police. The police arrived and tried to inspect the room pretending to be plumbers, but Nulda shut the door in front of them. They decided to break the door, but before they managed to do that, they heard two gunshots. After they broke the door, they saw two dead bodies. Andrews shot his girlfriend and then committed suicide using his gun. Every fairy tale needs a good old-fashioned villain. So there you go, this is the story of Milton Franklin Andrews. A cheat, a hustler, a criminal, a murderer and a suicide. And also the author of the greatest book on cards ever written. Question arises, can we separate a book from its author? Imagine that in the 1940s, when Gardner started his investigation, Erdnays had still been alive. Would magicians want to meet him, ask him a couple of questions? take an autograph, ask him to show some moves and learn some cool techniques from Milton Franklin Andrews, aka Erdnays, a criminal? But before we get too deep into this ethical question, I have some news for you. For a long time, Milton Franklin Andrews was considered to be Erdnays. There is a book, The Man Who Was Erdnays, which was written by Martin Gard and his associates. It is quite rare, but I was lucky to find it on eBay. and. For a long time it was considered to be the final word on the subject. And this is the book which presents all the evidence in favor of Milton Franklin Andrews. But in 1999 in Los Angeles, during the Conference on Magic History, Richard Hatch and David Alexander came on stage with a revolutionary claim. Milton Franklin Andrews was not Erdnays. According to them, Erdnays was someone else. A man that no one in the magic world had ever heard about before. And their evidence was absolutely fascinating. The game, Mrs. Hudson, is on.
If by now you are intrigued by the story of Erdnase and want to learn about this other theory that I mentioned and also hear me play the complete version of the main theme of BBC Sherlock on my ukulele, then please subscribe to this channel and hit the notification button because the next episode is coming very soon and there will be some amazing detective stories and incredible plot twists, I promise. My name is Alex Romanov. This was Art of Impossible, and I will see you very soon.